Welcome to The Metabolic Link, a medical and science-focused podcast that explores the common thread of metabolism in health and disease. This is where science meets society. Welcome back to another episode of The Metabolic Link. I'm your host, Victoria Field, and today we've got a really great guest that's going to be diving into prenatal nutrition. This is relevant to so many people and such a hot topic, um, prenatal nutrition. It's really something that doesn't get discussed often enough. Um, I might be a little bit biased because I'm currently 37, almost 37 weeks pregnant as we speak. Um, but today's discussion is really a fascinating exploration of some of the evidence around real food in pregnancy. So today's guest is Lily Nichols. She's a registered dietitian, nutritionist, a certified diabetes educator, researcher, author, and she's got an incredible passion for evidence-based prenatal nutrition. Her work is known uh, for being research-focused, very thorough. If you've read her books, you know what it, you know what that means, and critical of outdated dietary guidelines. She is co-founder of the Women's Health Nutrition Academy and the author of two books, Real Food for Pregnancy, this one right here, and Real Food for Gestational Diabetes. Lily's best-selling books are used in university maternal nutrition courses and have influenced prenatal nutrition policy internationally, which is pretty incredible. Um, and the reason we really wanted to invite her actually as a speaker at Metabolic Health Summit 2024, January 25th through the 28th in Clearwater Beach, Florida, is because she truly leads with the evidence. Um, if you've read any of her books, uh, they are just a wealth of knowledge and just full of references around what we really know when it comes to real food uh, for pregnancy and even postpartum as well. So today's uh, conversation is a really great one, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did recording it. Lily, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today and for um, participating in Metabolic Health Summit 2024. We're thrilled to have you as a speaker. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to both today and uh, the formal speaking engagement. Yeah, it, it'll it certainly be a lot of fun. We It's, it's a hot topic, prenatal nutrition, um, pre and postnatal nutrition, really, especially when it comes to, you know, the, the low carb field in, in general. And, and just how that matches up with current dietary guidelines, as I'm sure you know. Right. And I briefly mentioned to you, I actually um, have your book right here. Found this uh, amazing uh, beast of a book. It's just it's incredible in terms of references and just, you just do such a phenomenal job uh, really just citing the research. And that was one thing, it was in my first trimester when I found this book, you know, I follow a low carb, whole food diet and was like, oh, I'm curious of, you know, the prenatal approach to nutrition and started looking and I was like, I'm not finding very many things that line up with, you know, the things that I've been living in my life now for quite some time until I found your book. And I was so blown away um, by how just evidence-based and exciting it is in terms of what you're doing for the field and how you're pushing uh, really prenatal nutrition forward and influencing nutrition policy in many ways as well, which is which is great. So I just have to first say thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I would love to dive in for those who not who are not familiar maybe with how this sort of all started. You're a registered dietitian. Um, you know the things that you discuss in your book are very much evidence based. However, not really fully accepted, maybe mainstream yet, right? Yeah. Um, that's the goal. Um, so how did this start for you? Um, kind of give people a little bit of backstory into how you jumped into dietetics and then how things kind of shifted. I'm sure once you sort of peeled back the curtain of <laughs> prenatal nutrition as well. Yeah. I mean, I've had a lifelong interest in nutrition. So I was one of those um, rare teenagers who knew what I wanted to study in school. Um, and I actually stuck with it and didn't change, uh, didn't change majors, added in an art minor, but I didn't change my major. Um, I was already introduced to some of the concepts that I'm still teaching about today, all the way back then, like I was introduced to ancestral nutrition um, via some of the writing of Dr. Weston Price. And that that really gave me like a different um, vantage point when I was going through my conventional training. Um, as you're probably well aware, 
education for dietitians is very uh, regimented and very much based upon the government dietary guidelines. Um, so our textbooks really kind of only show one side <laughs> of the nutrition coin. So I was always kind of looking at the information I was learning through a critical lens, um, as I had personally experienced uh, significantly improved, you know, health and well-being just by changing my diet to more ancestral stuff, which for me involved like eating more foods of animal origin, eating more fat, um, and especially reducing the carbohydrates in my diet. Of lifelong reactive hypoglycemia episodes when I overdo carbs, which I pretty much did my entire life until I realized that that was an issue. Um, yeah. So once I was completed with my full training, and yes, you have to do a lot of just like smiling and nodding to get through it and get your credentials and whatnot. Um, I kind of by happenstance ended up working in the prenatal nutrition field, um, actually in the gestational diabetes uh, area specifically. And it was in that role or several roles actually in the gestational diabetes space that I realized, wow, our guidelines are way off the mark. I mean, already I kind of had an overarching disagreement with the dietary guidelines, which push such a low fat and such a high carb um, intake, which I feel like is just kind of a mismatch for human physiology as a whole. Um, but for pregnancy specifically, and for women who have insulin resistance, i.e., you know, gestational diabetes, essentially, um, pushing a high carb diet on them does not improve their blood sugar regulation, which certainly doesn't improve their pregnancy outcomes because really the vast majority of issues we associate with gestational diabetes come from the average blood sugar levels that a woman experiences during pregnancy. Um, but you are widely taught that you can't go low carb in pregnancy. It's dangerous for a variety of reasons we can get into or not in this podcast. Um, yeah. And so I really <laughs> dove into the literature on that to see like, well, if I recommend they, you know, eat to the meter, like eat whatever level of carbohydrates gives them good blood sugar balance, like, is that doing any harm per se? Um, and so that kind of started me off with the whole questioning more specifically, like the guidelines and the origins of all the various levels and things we're, we're taught are, are optimal um, via the guidelines. So looking at the macronutrient guidelines, you know, first I was looking at carbs and then I'm looking at protein and then I'm looking at fat. And then I start diving into all the micronutrients. It's like, holy cow, this is a, <laughs> this is a minefield to say the least. Um, so definitely my work started with gestational diabetes. It's expanded since then. And I'm really always kind of looking at the gaps between what the guidelines are saying is optimal and what is actually required, um, for, you know, fetal development, for mother's health during pregnancy, for a strong recovery postpartum, for reducing pregnancy complications. And there's... <laughs> there's significant area for improvement. I'll, I'll put it that way. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you've uncovered so much in um, both of your books, really. And I know you're working on the third here, which is exciting. Um, and it's so interesting once you start to kind of peel back the layers. Um, I, I can only imagine as you kind of prepare to write these books <laughs> and, and, you know, it's not just it's not just food. It's just a variety of things, exercise, there's, um, you know, you even talk about toxins in here and you just really do a great job at just saying, hey, like kind of what, what are we doing here <laughs> exactly? So right. um, let's talk a little bit about requirements though and maybe jump into one of the most controversial of the macronutrients when it comes to pregnancy, which you briefly touched on, carbohydrates. Yeah. Um, you know, this is something that I believe with the dietary guidelines in terms of um, RDA, you know, there we're talking i think over 50 percent of calories coming from carbohydrates alone is sort of the recommendation which i'm certainly not anywhere close to that um being 37 weeks pregnant and and baby boy is not not having any problems growing which is great right. however you have so many i can't tell you how many people are like you're eating a low carbohydrate diet oh my gosh you need the carbohydrates i think 
the recommendation is don't go below, you know, 175 grams. It could be detrimental. So I would love to dive a little bit into what does the evidence actually show? What do we know? What are your, I know what your recommendations are, but I'd love to share that with our audience in terms of, um, you know, what, what you think should be sort of the approach that we're taking, especially when we're considering things like gestational diabetes, um, you know, that can develop over time. Yeah, I, well, certainly this was a major area of um, contention in my career. And actually, this is the whole reason I wrote my first book, <laughs> Real Food for Gestational Diabetes, yeah. was because everybody, all the dietitians I knew were saying you can't go below 175 grams of carbohydrates per day yeah. in pregnancy. And when you ask why, they say it's because it could harm fetal development. Um, so my first step in kind of uncovering what to make of that recommendation was looking at the origins of that. And, and the origins are, you, you find it in the uh, Institute of Medicine, like 1300 page document on macronutrients. <laughs> it's like, I can only to, imagine the reading you've done. <laughs> yeah, you have yeah. to slog through um, to find it. I mean, obviously it's broken into sections. I didn't have to read all 1300 pages, but you can kind of slog through to the section on carbohydrates and start reading about the pregnancy part. And essentially they're starting with an, a, assumption that every adult human being needs an average of about 100 grams of carbohydrates per day just to live. Okay. Right. Um, then, so that's called the estimated average requirement. Then they add um, additional amounts for the amount of increased energy expenditure during pregnancy, assuming that about half of your diet is coming from carbohydrates. And then they add additional for the amount of glucose that we know a fetal brain uh, consumes per day. Um, what's missing from this information is, well, acknowledgement that plenty of people survive on very low carbohydrate diets. So the, the 100 grams can basically completely be obliterated because the estimated average requirement is completely bunk. And even in the document, they, they state, you know, the amount of carbohydrates required to sustain life, you know, is essentially zero as long as adequate calories are coming in from fat and protein. Um, of course, because we can create glucose via gluconeogenesis, right? So then that leaves the, you know, remaining amount, um, which sure, like I, I don't actually advocate for like a zero carbohydrate uh, diet, um, however, I'm just kind of like poking holes in the, the logic here that's used to get to the 175 grams. Right. And then you take into consideration what, you know, hunter gatherer populations consume worldwide and the average carbohydrate consumption is 16 to 22% of calories worldwide. Um, slightly more as you get to the equator, although it doesn't usually exceed about 30%, 35% of calories and then lower as you go or, uh, to the uh, higher latitudes, to the poles, where you have extreme and longer winters where you simply don't have plant foods growing for uh, a large proportion of the year. So you're just eating a larger proportion of your calories from animal food. So it was like, okay, from an ancestral perspective, does this even make sense? Like, no, clearly, like if human beings could not survive without 175 grams of carbohydrates per day, cultures that didn't have access to high carbohydrate foods would die out. I mean, they wouldn't be able to reproduce. Clearly that's not the case because you do have populations um, living at these extreme latitudes. So um, that was sort of the, the intro part into that. I don't know how detailed you wanna get. The other um, area of concern was uh, whether or not eating low carb would contribute to ketone production and whether ketones are overtly harmful for fetal development, because that's, that's the logic that's given. Um, it's actually kind of shocking in conventional like gestational diabetes care. If you come in and your uh, blood sugar is well controlled, but they happen to test your urine for ketones and they come out positive for ketones. Yeah. They will actually tell you to eat more carbs, even if it makes your blood sugar a disaster. And the solution is to just take 
insulin or oral hypoglycemic medications. That is actually considered safer than eating low carb and spilling ketones. Okay. Wow. Now there's a whole lot to unpack here. Um, first of all, where did the information on ketones being overtly harmful for brain development come from? And there's a lot of shoddy data that led to that conclusion that I won't go into extensive detail on. That's all in um, chapter 11 of Real Food for Gestational Diabetes. Um, but those are based on faulty assumptions. There's also assumptions that urine ketones correlate with blood ketones, and that's actually not the case. And then third, there's the consideration of what's physiologically normal in pregnancy. Like, is everybody spilling ketones? Are people only spilling ketones when they go low carb? Is it only women with diabetes that are spilling ketones? Like what's going on here? Right. Um, and what I realized is that they were conflating the presence of urinary ketones with diabetic ketoacidosis, instead right. of acknowledging that there are different situations in which you can have ketones present. So DKA is overtly, absolutely, without a question, extremely harmful to a baby's development, including their brain, and it is a medical emergency. And that is not happening in a normal, healthy pregnancy, nor is it happening really in any pregnancy outside of people with pre-existing diabetes that requires insulin therapy. Like they, they don't have insulin production in their system because you have to have uh, a situation of a deficit in insulin in order to get to DKA. Okay, so that, okay fine and good, DK is a problem. Then you have two other types of ketosis left over, which nobody ever talks about in the diabetes world. I mean, I'm a certified diabetes educator. It's not in our textbook, you know, but there are other types of ketosis, nutritional as you're well-versed in, and starvation ketosis. So in starvation ketosis, you have a situation of elevated ketone levels because somebody is starving and they are breaking down their body tissue for survival. Obviously, I think we can uh, come to the conclusion that that's not a good idea during pregnancy because your need for energy, micronutrients, macronutrients is all quite high. So starvation, that's a problem. Don't be um, fasting, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. And then the final one is, is nutritional ketosis. And what the, the data did not say, as I realized, was that nutritional ketosis was any sort of problem. Um, what the data did seem to say, at least at the time when I was writing that book, was that, um, you know, pregnant women as a whole tend to go into mild ketosis actually quite readily, more so than any other population. They call it accelerated starvation, which is a really funny term. But essentially, you know, ketosis is kind of like a backup mechanism for energy, um, keeping your energy supply up um, in your body. And during pregnancy, when your metabolic rate is so high, and you do burn through fuel rather quickly because you're prioritizing growing this brand new human being, um, you do dip into ketosis much more easily than when you're not pregnant. Um, is this a problem? Not necessarily because literally almost every single pregnant woman on the planet is in ketosis overnight. And certainly by the time she wakes up in the morning, unless she's like waking up and eating all night long, you are pretty much guaranteed to be in ketosis um, overnight and in the morning. And some women even dip into ketosis between meals fairly mm -hmm. readily. Um, but that doesn't mean that your blood ketones are getting to harmful levels where it's harming fetal brain development like it could with diabetic ketoacidosis. So urine ketone levels, um, which are widely used to guide, sadly, uh, whether a woman needs to eat more carbs or something, they have no correlation with blood ketones whatsoever. And they're pretty much almost always going to be high um, after a long period of time without eating or in anybody who's uh, not eating a significant amount of carbohydrates. And it is not at all correlated with detriments in uh, you know, fetal brain development. Um, one other little factoid I just want to throw out, and I know this is a really long answer, but it's just some other food for thought that made me go, this doesn't make sense is that babies are born in ketosis and they remain in ketosis for right. at least the first month of life, but they have the highest ketone levels in the first few days of life. You know, when they're brand new babies and they're not taking in a large quantity of breast milk yet, you know, they're taking in colostrum, but it's in kind of small quantities. 
um, they're actually burning through some fat stores to sustain their energy levels. So babies are actually born in ketosis. And so the other thing that made me go, well, how would this harm fetal brain development? Like, does a switch go off where suddenly, like, you know, during pregnancy, it's harmful, but then in infancy, it's suddenly a good thing. And, and no, about 30% of fetal brain energy needs are actually met by ketones. Um, and the placenta even manufactures its own ketones to wow. send those to the baby specifically. I mean, this isn't an accident. <laughs> so, right. so all of this combined led me to the conclusion that, you know what, the data we have on like harms to fetal neurodevelopment are much stronger for things like elevated blood sugar um, yeah. than they are for ketones outside of the one exception or I guess two, diabetic ketoacidosis and starvation ketosis. But in somebody who's eating enough food, but they're simply eating fewer carbohydrates, their blood sugar is at a great level, their micronutrients at a, are at a great level, they're eating plenty of protein, brain development is perfectly fine, no issues. Yeah, that was an, a phenomenal answer, by the way, not too long at all. <laughs> you really covered the bases there. And like you said, I mean, this is, this is something that we all have the ability, this metabolic state, we all have the ability to shift gears, right? Between utilizing glucose as a primary source and ketones. And even as infants just first introduced to the world, this is the state that we're in. And it makes a whole lot of sense when you put it into that context. Um, you know, as somebody on a low carb diet, I've had uh, ketones in my urine. Thankfully, I have a great physician who's um, familiar with sort of a lower carb uh, approach. Um, but it's, it's, it is important to say, you know, of course, blood sugar, I think is one of the most important things to kind of keep track of. Right. And one of the things I loved in, in your book, um, and in fact, even somebody who frequently uses a CGM and tests blood sugar and all these things, you come up, um, into that, uh, glucose tolerance testing time. And you're like, Oh gosh, I have to drink this bolus of <laughs> sugar. How am I going to handle this? And I love that about your book. And you just present a few ways to work through that. And um, you talk about the importance of blood sugar and all of those things. But speak to that a little bit in terms of maybe blood sugar testing during pregnancy, the the possibility of the alternative option of, which I did actually, thanks, thanks to you kind of, I don't know, causing a light bulb to go up. Oh, yeah, I could just test like I normally do for maybe yeah. two weeks. Granted, there are some little nuances with that. Um, but talk a little bit about blood sugar testing and the possibility of maybe, you know, if you are on a low carbohydrate diet, um, much like I think yourself, you you went into that uh, <laughs> glucose testing or that glucola drink. And uh, originally, you know, for those on a low carb diet, you may actually fail a test. And so speak to that a little bit from, you know, sort of a metabolic stand, standpoint and also uh, where blood sugar testing for you fits into the mix in pregnancy. Sure. Yeah, so the, the dreaded uh, gestational diabetes screening tests, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm in a really funny place in this space, um, having worked like in conventional healthcare and seeing just the really adverse outcomes that can happen when blood sugar is not well controlled during pregnancy. And so I, I see right. immense value in identifying blood sugar issues. And then on the other side of the coin, working with people who are really health aware, and then sort of like forced into doing really what's kind of a rather extreme test. Um, if you're not somebody who eats a whole lot of sugar on a regular basis, um, <laughs> sort of, I feel like I'm between a rock and a hard place because I do advocate for uh, blood sugar balance for everybody across the board. And I think it's important to do some form of testing. Um, if there's a blood sugar issue, you do want to address it. But I think there's different tests that can work in different scenarios. Now, this is in stark contrast to, you know, ACOG guidelines, which is widely, you know, the only acceptable method to diagnose gestational diabetes is a glucose tolerance test, right? That That is considered the gold standard. Um, but it doesn't take into consideration that when you have somebody who is adapted to a low carb diet, their pancreas is not accustomed to seeing a large bolus of carbohydrates at one time. And so there can be a delayed insulin response resulting in a false positive on the test. And we've, we've known that 
I mean, at least until since the 1960s, that if you put people on a low carb diet and then follow up with a glucose tolerance test, they will likely fail. Their results will come out too high. But if you put them on a higher carb diet for a period of time leading up to the test, about a week usually, they, if their pancreas and everything is functional, they'll pass the test. Same thing is true in animals, by the way. Animals who are adapted to grazing will fail a gl glucose tolerance test. If you provide them with grain rations, mm -hmm. then for a period of time, they will pass the glucose tolerance test. So I think you have your options. If you eat low carb um, and you want to do the glucose tolerance test or you're in a practice where you feel like that's the only option that they'll accept, even though I roll my eyes at that, you can carb load for about a week prior to the test, which is usually about 150 plus grams of carbs per day. It doesn't have to be ridiculously high, but certainly some carbs, um, especially if you're somebody who's eating quite a low carb diet, um, you'll be much more likely to have your be testing at a time when your pancreas has adapted and has gotten used to pumping out boluses of insulin. If you're, if you don't want to do that, you might want to consider one of the alternative options and really your best option um, outside of some tests that can be done in the first trimester. But if you're coming up at that like 24 to 28 week mark where they're doing that gestational diabetes screening, your best option is probably some form of blood sugar testing at home. So um, that can be done with, you know, a regular finger prick and glucometer. Um, you also could use a CGM. I mean, I really like using a CGM because you can see a much more uh, specific picture of what's happening, what your spike is doing. Um, some people have, you know, their qualms with, with accuracy and whatnot. But like for me, for example, there are certain carbohydrate foods that I do not respond well to at all, like cause a massive blood sugar spike followed by hypoglycemia. I mean, it's just classic reactive hypoglycemia, which now that I understand that, I can see why <laughs> I yeah. suffered for so long um, yeah. <laughs> with those symptoms. But like, you know, drinking pure sugar like a glucola, not a great idea. So I actually did the glucola at least the one hour screening, um, my first pregnancy, and I failed by a point, mm -hmm. and then went had all my blood sugar testing supplies at home, went really bad reactive hypoglycemic. And then I decided, you know what, I'm not going to follow up and do the three hour test as they recommend. I'm going to just test my blood sugar um, at home. And luckily, they agreed to that. And I like, I didn't have a single high reading. I mean, I and I even like carb loaded, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have this like, uh, gluten-free ravioli and taking, you know, 60 grams of carbs just from that at a meal, like high glycemic, like potato starch, right? right. <laughs> fine. Blood sugar is totally fine. So I was like, okay, I don't think it's actually um, gestational diabetes. Um, in my follow-up, uh, my subsequent pregnancy, I just did CGM uh, each trimester, checking with a glucometer to make sure it was generally accurate. And again, there was no issue. So um, yeah. I think it's, it's a helpful option, especially for women who are already um, pretty dialed in with their diet and metabolic health. I think it's a good option. I think the glucose tolerance test still has a place. Um, it certainly makes it easier on the clinician because they just want black and white answers. Whereas like interpreting blood sugar data takes some work. Like you have to know what you're doing. <laughs> and so, A lot right. of uh, healthcare practitioners that don't really know anything about blood sugar management, they just want to use they just want the one test with the cutoff points. Um, I think for clients who aren't as dialed in on their health habits or people who regularly eat a fairly high carb diet, um, I don't think there should be any qualms with doing the glucose tolerance test. I mean, your yeah. smoothie that's mostly fruit or whatever is probably about the same as what's in the glucose tolerance test. Or if you're eating cereal and milk and a banana and orange juice for breakfast, like the glucose tolerance test is less carbs than that. Like your body should be able to handle that blood sugar spike yeah. just fine. Right? right. Um, so I think, you know, we can kind of pick and choose based on, on our own health history. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. For me, it's, you know, if I eat a high sugar or high carbohydrate meals, it's just, I feel it like mentally, you feel like this big oh, shift. Yeah. And when you're already dealing with this cascade of hormones in pregnancy, I'm like, I don't, I don't need to affect my mood any more than I have to at this yeah. point. 
So um, it's really interesting, though. I'm so curious, and I know you kind of touch on it in, in the book, too. Blood sugar balance is just really this great foundation or goal for those who are pregnant. And I, I just want to understand from your perspective, you know, I, I was one of the lucky ones in terms of first trimester, I didn't have any morning sickness, um, which was amazing. And I know some women totally suffer and there can be a wide variety of reasons for that. Many women go on to develop gestational diabetes. It sort of feels like it comes out of nowhere, even if they feel, you know, like they're eating well, they're exercising. Um, same goes for preeclampsia. But I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts around how much nutrition might play a role in some of these things. Maybe not the entire picture, of course, but like a factor when it comes to these kind of three things that many women suffer with throughout pregnancy. Yeah, we can start with the nausea. And that's probably the most, um, maybe a little more difficult to make strong conclusions on, you know, the origins and why it happens. But uh, certainly there seems to be a link between like blood sugar stability and the severity of nausea. So, so in the first trimester, you're actually in a little bit of a honeymoon period where your pancreas is kind of getting ready to adapt to the impending insulin resistance that hits in later pregnancy. So you actually start producing not a huge amount, but slightly more insulin and your insulin sensitivity also improves. So you're actually more prone to go hypoglycemic um, in the first trimester. And of course, the natural response to hypoglycemia is like hunger, or if it's really severe, nausea sometimes comes along with it, and cravings for carbohydrates because your body just wants you to get your blood sugar up quickly. But that can kind of trap you in a little bit of a cycle because if you're only fulfilling this need for raising your blood sugar back up with carbs, you end up going hypoglycemic right. very quickly after the fact, especially right. because your insulin and insulin sensitivity are already in a place that they're just like, they're trying to just like suck nutrients out of you very quickly. Um, so if you can kind of interrupt that by getting just a little bit of protein in there, a little bit of fat in there, um, focusing on some higher fiber carbohydrate options like beans and legumes sometimes are fairly well tolerated in the first trimester, um, but also have, you know, protein and fiber in them. That can really help like just interrupt that hypoglycemia cycle. Um, and so that's a big one that it can be hard if your nausea is like really, really severe because like everything is off-putting, especially oftentimes protein-rich foods. So you might have to pick and choose which protein-rich foods are not averse in on that particular day in that particular moment, because it really can vary day to day. But oftentimes, like I said, some of the non-meat ones tend to work a lot. So um, dairy products like cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, um, beans, legumes, like Mexican food was great for my nausea. So whatever, sometimes <laughs> eggs, cheese. Yeah, Mexican food's great. Um, and I think part of that has to do with just, you know, your electrolyte needs are also up um, right. starting in the first trimester. So that Mexican food's like really high potassium. Beans are high potassium. Tomatoes are high potassium. They're salty. They have that salty, sour flavor, which is often so good for nausea. So, you know, play around with what's going to work for you. I mean, worst case scenario, you have to add like protein powders to, you know, a smoothie. Um, and that's, you know, that's also fine as a, you know, stopgap measure, but it really does seem to help. That's, you know, of course, one of dozens of things that can possibly help with nausea. But as far as the protein component, I think there is a case to be made for trying to get enough of that in. Um, as for gestational diabetes and preeclampsia, there is certainly overlap on, on the blood sugar issue. So, Elevated blood sugar tends to go along with elevated blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a connection I made like in clinical practice without going into the literature. I would notice that the women who were referred to me with preeclampsia, I worked in like a high risk um, uh, fetal medicine uh, clinic. Um, mm -hmm. So mostly complicated pregnancies, a lot of gestational diabetes, which is mainly why I was there. But they would also bring in um, or refer other complications to me as well. And so what I noticed when I do a diet recall on women with preeclampsia is almost without fail, their diet was 
extremely imbalanced, mm. usually a whole bunch of refined carbohydrates. Like I remember one specific example of a lady who was eating, she would eat, I don't know if this was like carryover from the nausea phase or what, but she was far along in her pregnancy. She would eat a whole sleeve of um, saltine crackers oh my goodness. in a single sitting. I mean, wow. that's just pure white. <laughs> white flour. Um, in another case, I had a lady who would drink two gallons, not two gallons, two, I guess, I don't know if it's gallons or not, two of those large like cartons of orange juice a day, like, two cartons of orange juice a day. <laughs> oh, my, oh my gosh. I can kind of sympathize. I know the appetite's raging, right? But that's the lot of sugar. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, is that her body pushing her to like get more potassium because her electrolytes are all off balance? Right. Or is that just like, Wow. But the result of that certainly would be a massive blood sugar spike. So what I observed across the board, I'm giving two of the more extreme examples, but even the less extreme examples, there seemed to be um, insufficient protein intake and way excessive intake of refined or high glycemic carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. um, and when we dialed that in, focused more on getting, you know, protein, some fat, some carbs still, but not an excessive amount and choosing higher quality carbs, yeah. like the blood pressure got better. Oh, that's the good. The got better, but also, you know, the blood sugar got better. And in those examples, especially because they were like patients in our clinic, like they were women who had passed the gestational diabetes screening, right? Mm -hmm. You right. can get a false negative on that screening test, by the way, right? If your insulin production was real high, yeah. You might actually pass the test, but you're extremely hyperinsulinemic and you just happen to come in below the threshold. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean you're in like optimal metabolic health yeah. to pass a glucose tolerance test, right? Um, but there's definitely overlap uh, with the two of them. And so just one of the major things for both conditions, gestational diabetes and preeclampsia, is just shifting that macronutrient balance um, pretty dramatically. I, I used to focus a lot more on like the reducing the carbs. And I've actually found that focusing on increasing the protein actually is the biggest one because that, that naturally results in significantly better satiety. You're just fuller for longer. So you don't have the cravings and don't have to deal with the willpower of trying to hold back on the carbs. Like if you're reducing the carbs, you have to replace those calories with something else. And the biggest factor for me is making sure women are getting enough protein, not going over the top at restricting their fat intake and just choosing higher quality carbohydrates, less of the white flour products, less of any drinks that are sweet, including juice <laughs> yeah. and uh, just having them as like a small, you know, they're like an accent side dish at a meal, not like a gigantic plate of pasta or, you know, sandwiches all the time. Um, just the carbs are there as like, a delicious side dish, but not the center stage. Right. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, I know for a lot of women, it's, it's just sort of survival mode pregnancy is absolutely I mean, so many things that come along with, um, pregnancy that's I've been, uh, uh, you know, I feel grateful enough to have experienced, but, um, and I know there's some other factors too, of course, that can contribute to things like, um, preeclampsia and what have you, but it seems like, you know, maybe trying to, keep that blood sugar stable does definitely doesn't hurt. And in your experience, kind of seeing almost like a shift back in the other direction is a really great indication that it does make a difference. Um, so let's talk a little bit about protein, because I feel like that's obviously uh, another important macronutrient that unfortunately, I, I think I, I, the recommendations for that are way lower than probably where they maybe should be. <laughs> I know, especially in your opinion, I think something around, uh, well, I'll let you speak to um, sort of your thought process around actual protein requirements and some of the greatest sources of, of protein that maybe some women kind of are, shift away from because there's just so many foods that we're told not to eat and be careful and all of these things. So you're almost kind of tiptoeing around things like fish and eggs with beautiful yolks and all kinds right. of stuff that you may want to eat. So I'd love your thoughts on um, protein, because I know that's a big topic of the book as well, and where you feel they should be in order to really contribute to uh, proper fetal development. Yep. So yeah, when we think about everything that's going on in pregnancy and how your body is like building a whole 
human being right. and what we're made of and what our cells are made of. I mean, we're made of protein, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. so certainly just from a very rudimentary toddler logic, uh, we need more protein. The recommendations on protein for pregnancy essentially mirror the population-wide recommendations on protein, where if you look at the origins for how they came up with the RDA or the estimated average requirement, I mean, it is the amount to not die. It's not the amount for optimal health. And our understanding of protein requirements and even the roles of certain amino acids has absolutely exploded in the last 20 years. I mean, like every textbook that I had in my undergrad training should be completely rewritten. I mean, even this concept that some amino acids are not essential has never been scientifically proven. Like arguably there is a reason to try to consume some of all of them, yeah. which by the way, necessitates an omnivorous diet um, because they all play a role in our health. And especially when your body is essentially in a state of stress as pregnancy arguably falls into that category, there are certain amino acids that um, they call conditionally essential. So under you know normal conditions, you wouldn't think much about this amino acid. Your body can make plenty of it from others. And during pregnancy, it's been shown you actually need a direct source of a variety of amino acids. Glycine is one of them. There's several others, carnitine, taurine, um, that you need to get from your diet for your body to function optimally and to optimize the development of your baby, such as their brain or their circulatory system or, you know, on and on. So what I think shocks a lot of people is that the first ever study that directly estimated protein requirements in pregnant women was performed in 2015. So until that time, all of our recommendations had been essentially based off of, you know, factorial estimates. They did some math and estimated how much more you might need when you're pregnant, how much might be incorporated um, into the fetus throughout the pregnancy, and then they throw a number out there. And when they did that research, they found that our current recommendations are a significant underestimate of how much is truly required. Um, in early pregnancy, they were underestimated by about, I think it was 39%. And in later pregnancy, they were 73% too low. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the guidelines still have not been updated, yeah. but it essentially puts optimal protein intake closer to what um, athletes try to consume. Maybe not like the highest level competing athletes, but certainly pretty close. <laughs> um, well, surprising. I mean, pregnancy is like the biggest athletic event of your life. It's basically the Olympics. Let's be real. Yeah. I had somebody um, like compare pregnancy nutrition to bodybuilding. She's like, yeah, when you're talking about this, this really reminds me of like bodybuilding nutrition. I was like, well, I guess it kind of makes sense. You are building a body. Um, and also your body undergoes massive transformation and expansion as you're currently experiencing during pregnancy, um, like beyond comprehension. It's just like, how is it possible that my belly is this big? This makes no sense. You know, like yeah. your, your uterus is like, your uterus contains 800% more collagen at term than it does when you're not pregnant. It's absolutely huge. It's, it's the size of a watermelon. I, I'm literally um, in that phase that you're talking about right yes. now. You can't tell, but I am like, how is this humanly possible? That yes. I'm just, it's funny that you bring up bodybuilding. I used to be a professional fitness competitor and it's totally like that in terms of my mindset and okay, I'm preparing for labor, but food wise, you're just kind of like really like, I got to get all the building blocks in. And so it's yes. hilarious that you brought that up. <laughs> yes. Yes. I knew you could relate, which is why I wanted to uh, make right. some of those analogies right now. Yeah. yeah it's uh, it's wild. So yes, we need a lot more protein than uh, previously thought. I think this also applies to the general population as well, <laughs> but certainly pregnancy. And just to throw in one other interesting little factoid, and this research actually came out after Real Food for Pregnancy was published is that this uh, same group of researchers has looked at protein requirements in women who are three to six months postpartum 
and exclusively breastfeeding. And their protein requirements are even higher than women in the third trimester. Wow. Okay. It's like 1.7 to 1.9 grams per kilogram. I mean, you're talking about a lot of protein. Yeah. You know, the guidelines for postpartum, they basically don't exist. <laughs> they pretty much don't exist. Um, but they have some recommendations for breastfeeding women for the first six months um, postpartum, but they're, you know, really not talked about a whole lot. Right. I mean, there, there's no acknowledgement that your protein intake needs to be higher. The only reason they have it slightly higher for that phase in the guidelines is that your energy requirements are higher when you're breastfeeding and thus some proportion of your calories is coming from protein. There's no acknowledgement in the guidelines that protein requirements are, are higher postpartum and wow. yet they exceed what they are in the third trimester in pregnancy. So um, definitely building up this habit of increasing your protein intake during pregnancy is something that absolutely needs to be continued postpartum, makes a massive, massive difference in your recovery, your energy levels, your ability to cope with what feels like perpetually interrupted sleep when you have an infant. Um, everything is like significantly better if you just hit your protein requirements. This is why I'm just a broken record about it. I love it. No, no. And, that, and that's actually an area that I was going to talk to you about is sort of that postpartum phase that I think often gets, you know, the fourth trimester, right? It often gets forgotten about. And it's one of the, if or it's the biggest shift, hormonal shift of like any life stage of anything human that happens. Um, but it's just not uh, in terms of nutrition, there's not a whole big emphasis around it when, you know, you see certain fields like metabolic psychiatry exploding, right? Where we know we're starting to see how significant of an effect food has on mental health and overall just metabolic health and mitochondrial health and what have you. So I love your thoughts around sort of approaching that postpartum period. Of course, you, you just mentioned increase in, in protein, um, but other things that may support that massive hormonal shift and sort of help you better cope overall, especially on the mental health side of things. Yeah. Postpartum is it's a lot. There's a lot going on. I mean, I have two kids and so I I've been there. Um, so first of all, you want to think through like just the amount of energy your body has expended um, in labor and or for recovery. So like you can have a, uh, you know, a vaginal birth short or an intense or very long labor. You can have a vaginal birth followed by C-section or episiotomy or something, or you can have, a, you know, a, just a C-section in and of itself is major abdominal surgery. Like no matter which way it goes down, there's a lot to recover from. Um, and so you need to be thinking about the nutritional demands for your body to repair after that. Now, unlike any other major race or uh, medical giant surgery, you don't have this long period of rest without anything else to do ahead. You have 24 seven care of a newborn. <laughs> and, you know, traditional cultures acknowledged this and there usually were family members who would take care of you during that time um, and prepare all your food for you, do all the housework. So all you had to do was rest and recover and feed your baby, right? It'd be great if we could return to that. And obviously I'm a big advocate for as much help as you can bring in, but also as much permission you can give yourself to rest and not try to do, 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 do all this stuff right. when you have a newborn with you. Um, but you have, you know, those two considerations, then your body's switching over into lactation suddenly postpartum. <laughs> so you have the baby, you expel the placenta, like all of those pregnancy hormones pretty much overnight are leaving your system. And now all these other hormones are kicking in and you have lactation coming into play. You have a huge adjust adjustment that your thyroid um, goes through. It basically completely remodels postpartum as well. And all of these shifts require a whole lot of energy and a lot of micronutrients as well. Um, so I think we just need to be thinking 
or just acknowledging how much your body is going through in that time and really putting our emphasis on nourishing new moms. And um, although I can get kind of caught up on the weeds on, on like, oh, this micronutrient and this is doing this and you need this much of that. I mean, really on a, on a ground level, it comes back to very simple, basic human needs when you're postpartum. And the biggest one is nourishment, in my opinion. And yeah. that requires support in order to get that nourishment, which we've just talked about, but nourishment. And you will feel your mental health start to go haywire if your nourishment is not on point, which even with the best of intentions, it's actually really, really tricky to stay well nourished postpartum um, especially if you don't have helping hands, you know, on the ground in your house, like bringing you food. It's like you have this newborn, you're always like prioritizing the care of your newborn. It's built into our physiology as women. We have our babies and it's like you do everything in your power to protect that baby and to keep them fed. And so they're in your arms at all times. You don't want to set them down or maybe they just like won't be set down <laughs> for any period of time. Like every meal is perpetually interrupted. It's like, oh, no, the baby's crying. Like you're in the middle of a meal. I need to go change their diaper. Oh, they need to nurse. Oh, they need to do this. And then like two hours later, you're like, oh, crap, there's my meal. Or, oh, no, I forgot to eat a meal. If there's nobody there bringing it to you, you will forget to eat. And then it's like I'm famished and going to the pantry to get what's the easiest thing to grab? Mostly carbs which triggers a crazy blood sugar roller coaster, which is just awful for our mental health in all instances, but especially postpartum when there's all these hormone shifts and everything going on, you will feel the anxiety um, creep in when your blood sugar tanks. Um, and it makes a world of difference. I'm not saying nutrition is the only thing responsible for mental health, certainly not. It's very, very complex. But it is one of those fundamental things where if we do not address it, we are limited by how much we can do to improve our mental health via other means. So yeah. central to like just everything you think about as you, you know, bring a new baby in should be your nourishment because you cannot, <laughs> you cannot give, you cannot, you know, give from an empty tank, um, so, you know, I think a lot of us learn the hard way with our first pregnancy is we put all of our emphasis on birth planning and trying to have the perfect birth and, you know, all that. And then like second time around, other than getting like the right people in place that I wanted to have there for birth, all of my planning went to postpartum. <laughs> all of it. All of it. It was like the birth is going to unfold, how the birth is going to unfold. It's going to happen here with these people. But postpartum, right? It was like, that was the emphasis. And so um, I do have an article on my site called Real Food Postpartum Recovery Meals that links out to like 50 plus recipes and sort of walks you through the different ways that you can approach it. I'm pretty sure I wrote that during my second pregnancy, actually. Um, and that is a really good resource to utilize, regardless of how your postpartum support is going to go down. Like, at least plan ahead for what that's going to look like. It's really hard to ask for help when you're in the moment. It's easier ahead of time. And so just planning to have like some freezer meals or having the number of like a meal delivery service that you can call on or having a list of recipes that you can give to family members or having your community help with a meal train to bring you meals. Um, However it goes down, postpartum, there's postpartum doulas and postpartum chefs, like <laughs> there's all sorts of things, but you're probably not going to have the wherewithal to be up on your feet in the, in the kitchen cooking um, very much, particularly in the first couple weeks uh, post-birth. So yeah, plan ahead. How are you going to be nourished? Who's going to be there to help? <laughs> or well, if nobody that freezer better be stocked. Right. No, it's great advice. And that, that article, I've actually read that, that very article is super helpful. Um, great ideas that you've gotten there that I'm actually personally using myself. We're trying to stock up as we speak because <laughs> yes. it could happen in like a week or three weeks, who knows, but um, really, really great advice because, you know, like you said, nutrition is not the only thing that matters in postpartum, but you've got some of these key pieces that are, that are traditionally will help mental health in such a big hormonal shift, like, 
exercise that can't really be there because you're still recovering and sleep, which, you know, <laughs> uh, is almost impossible, likely when you first have a newborn. So just focusing on the things that you can and just the wonderful advice you gave and preparing ahead of time is, is really great, great advice. Um, I could probably talk to you for another couple of hours, but I know we're, we're coming up on time and I would love to just hear what you're most excited about when it comes to nutrition science as it relates to your work. So maybe some of, some of the um, more recent, hopefully there's some breakthroughs or emerging um, trends that you're seeing that you're really excited about and what's next for you. I know that you're uh, super busy, hard at work on a on a book and would love to hear more about sort of what you're excited about and what's next. Yes. Well, um, I'm a person who's always kind of keeping my, my nose in the research to keep tabs on things. So anytime there's new studies published on, you know, a micronutrient or an amino acid that happens to be uh, something I'm like crushing on at the moment. <laughs> I'm reading it. Um, and oftentimes I do try to write about those things as well um, on my blog or sometimes in my um, research briefs over on Instagram. I just think um, as a whole, the, the concept of um, epigenetics, you know, how our expression of our genes can be impacted by our health practices and with regards to, you know, pregnancy and fertility, how that impacts our offspring as well. Right. Um, that is probably my, you know, my, my biggest area of focus. Um, it kind of always has been, but it, it continues to be, I just find it really fascinating. Um, I think we have a lot more within our control with our health than we think. Um, I'm a big fan of like the concept of stacking the deck in your favor. You know, we can't control every single outcome. I, I certainly can't control which genes I inherited from my family. I can't control the effect that aging is having on my, on my body, but I can tweak little things to like optimize my chances of not developing type two diabetes, like my grandfather, or I can optimize my mitochondrial function and my energy and my general like well being with, um, you know, various dietary and lifestyle practices. So that's certainly the thing that keeps my attention, probably like many of the speakers, um, that we'll have at the summit. Um, and yeah, I'm looking at, at, presenting on that, hopefully some information on um, kind of diving into the, the epigenetics and the fetal programming and, and how metabolic health can be influenced, almost inherited um, from our parents, <laughs> which is, which which is, is wild. wild. Yeah, it's a wild, a lot of responsibility, right, comes along with that. And we didn't even really tap into that on, in this discussion, but we're so excited for you to dive into that at the conference because... That is, that is such an interesting area of like, you know, the choices that we make now, especially even before you get pregnant, right? Um, yeah. Some people just think about nutrition right as they dive into pregnancy, but what happened those few years before uh, also really matters. And so I'm very excited for your presentation around this topic specifically and, and where the science is headed in that regard. I think, um, I think we're going to find a lot of uh, exciting information coming out of the woodwork here in the next, you know, five, 10 years. That's going to really change um, and influence a lot around nutrition specifically. But in the meantime, you're doing a phenomenal job getting the message out around food, uh, real food specifically. And I just have to say thanks again for your hard work. I can only imagine how much work goes into what you do and the information that you put out into the world. So from uh, one pregnant lady, but <laughs> many, many others. Thank you for what you're doing in the world. It's pretty incredible. Um, where can people find you? Uh, what's what's coming up next? Anything else you'd like to mention before we go? Sure. Yeah. Well, you can find me on my my main website, which is lilynicholsrdn.com. Um, on there, you'll find you know a download link for the first chapter of Real Food for Pregnancy, by the way. So if you want to read it, get a little more information about what I'm talking about with Real Food. Um, but also like that chapter has a meal plan comparison with the micronutrient and macronutrient breakdown between conventional and like one of my meal plans. It just puts it in black and white. So you can see 
sometimes people are also shocked to see just how bad the conventional meal plan is. Um, so I'm like, this is what I'm up against, my friends. This is why this uh, this profession is a little bit challenging sometimes. Um, so that's over on my site. Of course, my blog, um, there's a bunch of different ways that, that people can work with me. Um, this past year, we launched the Institute for Prenatal Nutrition, which is an in-depth uh, mentorship program for practitioners. We will be running that again in 2024. Um, so I'm really uh, enjoying helping to train, you know, the next generation of, of prenatal nutritionists and, and arm them with actually evidence-based information so they're not just rehashing and giving out the same old tired guidelines that uh, don't actually perform very well in practice. Yeah, that's huge. That that implementation piece and helping other practitioners, I think, is such a, you know, that's an area that we cover at the conference, implementation of this, right? How does that work? Because, you know, it's it, because it's not sort of standard of care yet, it, it's so necessary in, in really yes. working with other providers to help them implement this with patients. So it's really exciting, the work that you're doing. And so excited to have you at Metabolic Health Summit 2024. If you're watching this, you don't have your tickets, definitely get them because we do sell out. Um, you can go to metabolichealthsummit.com. Come out, see uh, Lily speak, uh, really dive into the epigenetic side of things, which will be really exciting. And uh, we're just thrilled to have you as a speaker, Lily. And thank you so much for your time today. You bet. Thank you. Awesome. Bye, guys. Thanks so much for watching this episode of The Metabolic Link with Lily Nichols. Uh, if you want more information, as she mentioned there, uh, make sure you check out the uh, caption or the show notes because we'll link to her website, which is lilynicholsrd.com. Make sure you also get your tickets to Metabolic Health Summit 2024 held in Clearwater Beach, Florida, January 25th through the 28th because uh, we will sell out and her presentation is going to be one that you do not want to miss. Um, you can head on over to metabolichealthsummit.com, learn more information about Lily there as well and all of the other incredible speakers that we've got lined up. So until next time, hope to see you at the conference and hope to see you here on another episode of The Metabolic Link. If you liked this episode, make sure you share it, subscribe, comment, all of the things to help us get into more eyes and ears and spread the word of metabolic health and the field of metabolic face therapies. Thanks so much for watching.